Hi, I'm Jenny Jeffress, and I'm the Executive Director of the Madison Public Library Foundation. Thank you so much for joining us today for part of our educational workshop series presented by the Foundation. Today's topic is genealogy, and I think um, we have many participants joining us who are really excited to learn about a number of library resources that are available to learn more about your family's genealogy. Um, we have volunteers who help us put these workshops together, and I want to thank them. Uh, we have a planned giving committee, basically, that helps us do this work. And I just want to thank those volunteers for, for their work on our behalf um, to put this workshop series together. So we like to do this workshop series. We maybe have three to four presentations a year. We've obviously gone to Zoom uh, to do those. And we have one coming up in September uh, that you can be looking out for as well. So we're happy to do that as part of our work. If you have any questions about the Madison Public Library Foundation or the work that we do here, um, uh, please send us an email and let us know. You can send it to info at Foundation. Dot org. So thank you so much for joining us. We'll get started with the presentation. So I'm going to introduce one of our volunteers who helped put this workshop together. Her name is Laura Stilton Bierhoff, and she's the Senior Vice President and Managing Senior Counsel at Associated Bank. Laura is going to be our moderator today, and she is also going to be uh, facilitating questions at the end of this workshop. So thank you for joining us, and uh, we hope to see you at other future presentations. Thanks, thanks, Jenny. Um, well, welcome everybody. It's my pleasure today to introduce Martin Alvarado, who is going to be our speaker at today's event. Um, Martin, from an early age, has been interested in family stories told by parents, grandparents, and other relatives. Born to parents from Mexico and the United States, he's been fortunate to grow up surrounded by people on both sides who are passionate about their heritage and family histories. A one-time history and journalism major, Martin is keenly interested in the processes of research, interpretation, and documentation of the past and the present. Uh, so Martin will be speaking to us for a bit today. Um, at the end of his presentation, there will be a chance to ask questions. Um, you can enter your questions in the Q&A on Zoom. Um, so I will sign off for a little while and here's Martin for you. Thank you. Hi, thank you to Laura and Jenny for the introduction. I am thrilled to be doing this presentation. Um, genealogy, as was mentioned, has been one of my passions and one of the things that I've really been able to uh, pursue through uh, resources here at the Madison Public Library and through the work that people, relatives before me have done to really um, leave a legacy. And I see myself as someone who continues in their footsteps and continues their work and just finding out who my ancestors and forerunners were and what I what I can learn from documents. So I am the community engagement librarian for business and technology. I am here at the central library in the local history room, which is a very appropriate place to be doing this presentation. So let's go to the first part. So this is sort of like the bureaucratic part, the part that you always have to keep in mind before you get to the really fun stuff is what are you going to do with uh, the things that you find? Because I think once you start doing genealogy research, the amount of paperwork or the amount of links, the amount of information that you have can become really uh, difficult to deal with, can lead to confusion, can lead to frustration. So as much as we can have things structured from the beginning, it'll help out in the long run and will help us achieve our objectives, which are to discover more about our ancestors, about ourselves, to find interesting stories. And the best way is to have a solid foundation on how you organize those materials. So uh, here are a few different levels in which you might think about your collection and how you go about organizing all this material. So if you think about the collection, you have to think on the very basic level, maybe one of the two first choices you might make is, are you going to be doing paper copies, electronic copies, a mixture of both? Um, are you going to be relying on file folders? It could be a manila folder, or it could also be an electronic folder on the, in the cloud on a flash drive, although flash drives 
thumb drives are not the most stable way of storing information. A thumb drive is best used only to take information from one place to the other as they can lose that information and it might not be recoverable. So uh, first step, do not use a thumb drive for something that you are thinking you want to keep for the long term. Make sure you have a few backup copies or one ba good backup copy either in the cloud or on a solid state hard drive. You can also use, uh, went a little bit too further, but you can also use spreadsheets. Um, they are great to, ways of organizing. And if you've ever used Excel, you can put in links, you can put different categories of information, names, places, dates, and uh, sort them in different ways. There are also online genealogy platforms that do a lot of the work for this. So uh, those are definitely things you can consider. But one of the things about these platforms is that although they're convenient and efficient, the access is contingent on subscription, the terms of service might change, uh, someone who has ownership of certain records might withdraw them from access because they have intellectual property rights over them, and also the viability of the website or the company uh, might uh, just go under and then you are stuck without having that information. While the file folders require you to do a lot of work, it has the advantage that it has the potential for having unrestricted access to what you collect in perpetuity and will be easier to pass along to further generations. And one of the other things to emphasize is when you think of electronic records and paper, we have paper that has been known to survive over 1000 years under the correct conditions. Um, and we have electronic, plat electronic formats that even though they were done 30 years ago, we might not be able to access readily like WordPerfect and Geos and other text formats. So depending on how you're going to uh, think of how this, not just how you're collecting it right now, but how this may become the basis for future researchers in your family or other people who are interested in this subject. So uh, one of the uh, suggestions would be to store everything as TXT files. Uh, you might dress it up for a presentation and format it in, in a word processor, but if you just leave it in a very basic form, these are files that, a file format that's been around since the 1960s and that we can still uh, access to this day on whatever platform we go to. So I think we're looking for both the preservation and also the longevity of what we do. So that's sort of thinking on the big picture thing. Uh, perspective of things. The other thing is looking at the individual records. And I think one of the challenges that we go through is that if we start with one individual and then we go back 10 generations, we're potentially gathering information on 2,046 people per person just because of how exponentially that grows backwards. And that's not even uh, counting collateral relatives like aunts, uncles, cousins, and siblings. So one of the ways that genealogists historically have dealt with this is through uh, pedigree charts that include a whole line on one sheet of paper, family group sheets that show a family unit and its many members on one page, research logs to keep things organized. And there are a couple of print uh, resources. So whenever you see something in blue like this, and this uh, presentation will be shared with you later, um, you can click on this and these will take you to books in our collection that oh, I get a note, I believe I have not been sharing the screen. So forgive me for that. I just jumped into the presentation. So I will take one step back and show you the content that Okay, I apologize for that lapse. Um, you didn't miss much while I was talking. Um, this was the first um, slide that was on the screen and thanks to the event coordinators for letting me know. Um, and then this one, uh, you can see what I was talking about, the different levels of organizing things. So I was just elaborating on what you can find here. So you can find a couple of books that uh, that you can click on that would give you good information on how to handle a paper record. As you can see, they are from the turn of the 20th century, 21st century, and they are very still on that cusp when there wasn't that much information available on the internet as we know it was just starting. One of the things that's really useful is we have some 
free charts and templates from the National Geolog Genealogical Society. And I like these a lot because even though Ancestry has some of these resources, the basic pedigree charts and uh, family group sheets that you can find here are entirely fillable as a PDF. So these are very convenient if you want to be able to take notes along and you don't have to come up with your own format, this would be something that you could use, say, to um, do some forms uh, around um, if you wanted to share uh, something in the census or capture census entries and family relations. There are other uh, blank sheets of census forms that you can use, but I think um, if you look at this, this is probably the best thing to start with and it helps you keep your, or your information organized. And best of all, it's free and it's fillable as a PDF. So you can always go back to these and correct them and save them and make multiple versions, share them with other people. So it has that advantage of being electronic formats that can be widely shared. I think one of the things as to why we do genealogy is to be able to share all these things with relatives and uh, yeah, a lot of what we do is so we can do our, our own storytelling around all these fascinating things that we might find. And also, um, one of the things when you approach genealogy is that there's going to be so much information that it's best to try to figure out what you're trying to find out and have a focus. Otherwise, uh, I think it becomes a little bit unwieldy and also it just uh, might become so diffuse that you might see a lot of exciting things that happen, but you may lose focus and interest. So I think one of the things you can look at important dates that you want to find in specific facts, like the big life events, birth, marriage, death, religious events, like rites of passage, schooling, service in the armed forces, and then also the facts that you might want to find out or you might already know. So such as place of residence, what uh, your ancestors did for a living, uh, what did they do in their free time or who they were associated with, if they had uh, prizes or any awards that they found, uh, were they featured in the newspaper, did they have business associates, did uh, other relatives, were the other relatives colorful, you want to uh, see what you may want to find out and you might want to focus, I think, best of all to focus is on one person and one branch of the family rather than trying to do parallel things at the same time. And also then we look at when we have all these facts, how do the facts help build a life story and what connections or insights can we gain from the facts, compare them to what we know or what we don't know? How do they fit with family lore? Because family lore can be, uh, it's a great source. Usually we get all these colorful uh, tales, but for one thing, they've been passed down probably through a few generations and like a game of telephone, there might be some distortion and also there might there might be some apocryphal uh, tales or we don't really know, we need to separate the fact and the fiction from those. And also when we discover new information, where do the facts point us to? Do they allow us to go further back in time and look at other ancestors? Do they uh, point us in another direction? Do they challenge our expectations? So I think it's a question of uh, keeping an open mind, making sure that you, for each stage of research that you do, that you sort of come to a closure and a conclusion and wrap it up as neatly as you can before continuing in a further direction, either in the past or going sideways for a more horizontal look at another contemporary relative. So where do you start? the best place to start are the family stories and collections. So these can be things that you heard at the dinner table, things that maybe someone took the trouble to write down. I know that a lot of times people have gone with their older relatives and taken a tape recorder and just there might be some tape uh, cassettes lying around somewhere. Someone in the family might have those and those are great starting points because these might not give us absolute exact facts. And I'll go back to facts and how those can be variable according to different records, but they're always a good starting point because they are the things that people in your family thought were important to pass on. So in this case, we have this uh, photo, it's opening night of the Wisconsin Union Theater in 1940. Um, the person of interest here is the director of the theater who is um, pointed out with an arrow that the newspaper put in there. For my purposes, the interesting people are the people on the upper left-hand corner. 
who happened to be my grandfather and grandmother. Um, and it's just one of those where they're instantly recognizable to me and to relatives, but they, uh, there are so many other people in that picture who also have their own story, but someone in my family, likely my grandmother, uh, took care of annotating this and then laminated it with uh, some clear plastic tape. And we have some other details about it. We don't know what the date is because that date line was not put in correctly, but I think we have enough elements where if we wanted to try to find this picture in an archive, we would be able to find it. And it's a great starting point. It also gives us information that they were theater goers. We might try to find out what the name of the play was. Uh, we could figure out this is likely, or maybe before they were married or after they were married. So it'd be interesting to see if this was on a date or if, well, there's any number of possibilities, but finding this thing, it's the example of how finding one piece of information really opens the door to having questions and to having lines of inquiry that just become more interesting. So looking at family stories and collections, so we have examples of that. Uh, stories and family lore. We also have photo albums and slide collections. And one of the great things is I think a lot of people who had these collections also were very much into documenting and making notes about it, dating those photos before putting them in, an al in the album, writing on the back, writing where it was, writing who was in the picture. So those are always good to look at because they can give a lot of contextual information as to uh, what did they do? What did their backyard look like? Did they go to a building that they thought was important and took a picture in front of it for a certain occasion? Or did they go on, on a vacation somewhere? So that gives us a little bit of glimpse into the past. We also have people who have written diaries and autobiographies or who kept scrapbooks of newspaper items. We also have previous genealogical research. As I also mentioned, we might also have some recordings, cassette and videotape, and then sometimes we even have the files and other personal papers, which uh, might just show uh, the bills that were being paid, but they could also contain school records or documents of a more personal nature, or even sometimes it's amusing to find within water bills and things like that, there might be a little annotation on the margin of uh, someone's phone number or some interesting thing that may or not be something that leads to research, but could be a potential lead for further research. So um, here I have uh, part of my father's school record from elementary school in Mexico. Um, I can see where the school was located. Uh, also a great picture of my dad when he was probably seven or eight years old. And he is one of the people who's really uh, taken, uh, he uh, studied philosophy and then history of science. So He's been a uh, historian uh, for, for a very long time. And what he did is he took all these stories that uh, female relatives especially told him, including his great grandmother, his grandmother, my great grandmother, uh, talking about how in 1867, she possibly met the uh, deposed Mexican emperor of the Habsburg house, Maximilian, uh, because she lived across the street from where he was being kept before he was executed. So is that true? Maybe, maybe not. But I think that's part of uh, what we can do uh, during this sort of history. There's a great uh, reference here, sustainable geology separating fact from fiction and family legends that has a chapter that deals exactly with meetings with famous people. So that's always chapter nine. Uh, a good case study that also shows what the principles would be in finding a story like this. One of the things that uh, sort of checks out is that the emperor was executed in 1867. Uh, he lived in the same city from 1864 to 1867 in Querétaro, Querétaro, and she was born in 1862. So that meets one of the tests of it's plausible because in time and space, they coincided. It's very plausible, but is it true? We don't know. And the way we would tell this story is that, well, we don't know if it happened, but we don't have any proof that disproves it. And then just going back to another point and another service that uh, the library offers that has been invaluable to people doing family preservation and history is we have a personal archiving lab at the Central Library, which I believe was made possible uh, through a donation by 
Marvin Levy, who we were very thankful for his generous gift that allowed us to assemble the, all this equipment that can handle both videotapes, audio cassettes, photographs, negatives, paper-based documents, and DVDs. So a lot of times you might have some of the last recordings from a relative where they tell the, their life story, but you have it on audio cassette and um, you likely don't have a cassette player. You still might have one in your house, but we have a way of transferring those formats slides uh, from slide projectors so that you are able to look at that and tap into those resources, preserve those resources and share them with other loved ones and people in your family. So uh, that was a little aside, but something I wanted to mention because it ties in first as to how our role as genealogists is to uncover the stories, but also preserve them. So now we're going to be looking into some of the best practices for research and look at some of the challenges. So uh, to illustrate one of the challenges is how names can be recorded correctly and correctly and the number of variations that a name can present through this example. This is my great, great, great grandfather uh, who lived here in Madison. And this is the way he was represented in the census. His correct name is in the 1850 census, Livesey. In the 1870, his name was Levsey, and in the 1880, he's recorded as Livesey without the E. One of the things where we can find some consistency is that his family relations remain consistent through these, um, through these censuses. Uh, I'm not picturing that completely here, but just showing how that could be a possible way of looking at these things by verifying and cross-referencing with other uh, facts. And here are some basics. Um, whenever you look at information, look at it with a critical eye before incorporating it. This is especially vital for um, when you look at work of other people. There are people, there is a formal genealogical accreditation from people who follow principles and who do due diligence and really excel at providing factual information. But as much as Ancestry and other platforms have democratized genealogy. They've also made it so that uh, things that are shared there, like much of the content on the internet, do not pass through the same filtering process. Not to say that anyone who uh, is not a professional genealogist couldn't do a really good job of doing it, but I think we need to take with skepticism, uh, given the challenges that we see, any information that we are going to be incorporating based on someone else's research or even on some conflicting facts that we might find. So there will be conflicting information. Some of these conflicts might be minor and some of them might be large discrepancies. So we need to look at which sources we consider most reliable for a particular fact, but also we want to include variant information in the source of that other variant information because it could be another pathway as to how that person was identified in the past. So um, also, we need to remember that even the things that would be the gold standard and records, which would be birth and death certificates, those are also subject to error, to typos, and they're basically a reflection of an event that we did not witness, that we're looking at and then we're hoping was accurately recorded. If you've ever Googled yourself, you can see that there can be so many people with your exact name that still, as we go back in history, is very common, especially also because uh, there were a lot of times when family names were used in the second generation or third generations, or sometimes they skipped a generation so that we have people with the same name and the same family tree. Also, people may have come from the same area and when they emigrated and had common surnames, but then went to different communities and you end up with different names of people who could plausibly be the same ancestor, but they are not because just as we have people with the same name here that that happened in the past more than than we would think of so whenever you find something that's slightly off approach it with skepticism but also in the example with uh my livesey ancestor one of the things is that in a couple of those census entries his birth date is re birth year is recorded correctly as 1819 but in the one from 1870 it is recorded as 1813 but we know it's the correct person. Who knows what happened in the transcription with the census note taker or whoever uh, was looking at that. So it's always 
get to cross-reference with other facts to see if we have the correct person. And we also want to explore and map one generation or person thoroughly before moving to a previous one. Uh, one other good rule to follow is that you might find the best information in the big archive, not in the place where the person was born, but in the place where that person settled. Um, people tend to be most mobile between the ages of 18 and 40. I think it's a fact that's generally true now, but also especially true back in those days uh, when there was a lot of immigration and movement. There are, of course, also examples of people who stayed in one place and lived all their life in one community. So if we have uh, more than one fact, we can really establish and link documents that allow us to build a bigger picture and we can use a number of different things to allow us to make that link in a more, in a more uh, trustworthy manner or way that is more reliable. I talked about how we can use logic to see if events are plausible with regard to time. And also we can look at distances. This person uh, appearing on different sides of the United States when travel between the West Coast and the East Coast took something on the scale of maybe six months to maybe a few, uh, fraction, almost a year or more than a year. And yeah, would someone who was born on a given date be the correct age to have gotten married at a certain time or served in a war? Those are all questions that we always need to be filtering as we are incorporating records. And then one thing to really remember is that some of these collateral lines, the aunts, uncles, cousins, and relatives might be the link to a hard to find fact, which could be maybe the place of origin or some other important uh, thing, uh, maybe a place where people were settled. So as always human mach and machine transcription will introduce errors. And I will show a couple of examples of that. Uh, we already saw how the census uh, taker uh, takers over decades gave different accounts of the same last name. So one of the things to look at and to really focus on the census is the name variants and typos. We had that one example of the census and that can be part of the literacy level of the person providing the information and the person who recorded that information. We also have very interesting uh, things that happen with people immigrating to this country. So we have uh, anglicization of names, the names being rendered in English from other um, from other languages. So for example, Mueller is one of the most common names in Germany. When people came to the United States, either to fit in or because maybe there was some uh, anti-German sentiment, they may have changed it to Miller. So that change can take part of within one generation and really uh, influence how you would go about a search and how you would search for people. So if you have a Miller ancestor and then you run out of ways of finding people, uh, ancestors of that person, you might try looking for Mueller as an example. And one thing that I have here is the L. Smith matchbook. Uh, he was a anti-prohibition person. Uh, his, this was a matchbook uh, provided by Bombay Jin to try to get people to vote for him in 1928. And what's interesting about Al Smith, he was the mayor of New York. He was the uh, presidential candidate for the Democratic Party, uh, but he was actually Italian of, in origin. Well, he was Irish Italian and I have trouble remembering what the other ethnicity was. The point is, is that he was the son of, I believe Alfred Smith or his grandfather was named also Alfred E. Smith, but his grandfather, father was actually named Alfred Emanuel, Alfredo Emanuele, Emanuele Ferraro, which uh, would make Al Smith uh, the first Ferraro to be on a presidential ticket. But more importantly, it shows us how the birth name of Ferraro, it gets changed into Smith because Ferraro is a blacksmith. Fabro Ferraro is a blacksmith in Italian. But then you have Al Smith, where the concept of a Smith translates and maps directly into the Italian concept, but it has no relationship as you would have with Miller and Mueller with the, with the name changing slightly. Also, you might have people from English speaking countries who may change their names to an alias that sounds more American. And we see that also indeed with people from other countries who may add yeah, a name in English in addition to their uh, name that they were originally given in the language uh, from, of their parents. Also, one thing that might happen with name variants and typos is that you might have a neighbor when the census enumerator comes and 
he might not know the middle names. He might just know the nicknames of the people and he might have uh, not the correct idea as to where the people were born. So I might give a couple of red herrings in that. So these are all reasons to be skeptical of the census, but also to confirm the rule that trying to triangulate or at least have a couple of sources that can validate or verify a certain fact is the great work, the really base work that a genealogist must do in order to bring results that are trustworthy. Another thing to remember is that Benny, Joe, Peggy uh, nicknames and given names can be uh, used interchangeably. They can be recorded officially, but also Benny, Joe, and Peggy are given names for a number of people. So those uh, we need to look at name variants and look at uh, the possibility that we, if we have a, a Joe and we look for Joseph, uh, we might be looking at an entirely different person uh, because maybe the legal person's name was Joe. Cursive writing also introduces a lot of difficulty, especially uh, I still maybe was one of the last people who learned cursive in school, but uh, it's a practice that we've lost. We've lost a lot of the practice in deciphering cursive because we're not exposed to it as much, but much of the older records are recorded in cursive writing. Also, one of the problems that might cause a little bit of trouble is that we are working off sometimes of images instead of originals. We're looking at the census roll and it might be a washed out microfilm copy. There's errors in writing and recording, there are typos. And then also when a computer reads all these records, there is going to be optical character recognition flaws that might introduce artifacts or characters. Um, there have also been things that have changed, so such as the things of how things were spelled. So for a while, substituting an F for an S was completely normal in printed records and also in newspapers in the early 19th century. So uh, this actually says Harrison and Wilson, but um, it looks very different to how we would pronounce it. And also when we look at archives, they might be and records, they might be looking at the, we might be looking at different ways that a name could be indexed. So we could have Captain Wallace, John Captain Wallace, or John Captain with different ways of approaching when we look especially at titles and not just military titles, but things like senior, junior, et cetera. So we have a couple of web links here that describe how to get around some of these. So potential problems with records from genealogy.com. And there's also this great book in our collection, The Family Tree Problem Solver, Tried and True Tactics for Tracing Elusive Ancestors. And then just to show you, whenever you click on one of those charts, and I'm cleaning up my workspace because it was getting a little bit cluttered, it takes you directly here to our link cat, and you can go ahead and place a hole directly and have this brought in uh, to whichever library you want to request it. So. Uh, I just wanted to make sure that this presentation connected you to many of the great resources we have in our library. Okay, one of the questions that was posed prior to this is, uh, what can we do uh, when female ancestors, how can we really honor them and how can we really discover more about them? And that's uh, one of the things that I think we need to contend with and that we have our records have gotten better uh, for women as their own autonomous selves. But if we look back just a few generations that women often were the daughter of someone and then the wife of someone and there was no in between. Uh, we also had fewer documents signed or marked by women because there was in a lot of places restrictions on ownership of property, there was not equal access to literacy. So some of the practices we can do is we can record the maiden name always, because it also set, sets up the next step to find uh, the names of, of our female ancestor. We also, even though it's become a bit of a practice, we want to avoid uh, using Mrs. John Smith, just because we can put it on a chart. It's not really helpful, but it also gives us the impression that we've neatly tied up that thing when in fact it provides a zero information about the person. And there could be more than one Mrs. John Smith and a family tree if we went by that criteria. So also um, people from different populations have been excluded from literacy due to their gender, ethnicity, and social class. So it's very important, I think, where the family stories come in because a lot of these are told by women and passed on through those lines that we can listen to those and, and write those down, preserve them, because these uh, can provide some insight 
uh, for, as an example of different levels of literacy, my grandmother from the United States very carefully annotated and classified the pictures she took. So it's a joy uh, to have that much information. She was part of the 40 of 40, the 40 library students who graduated from UW Madison in 1940. On the other hand, my Mexican grandmother who is pictured here never learned how to read or write, but was a really gifted storyteller. She was just had so many family histories, very amusing stories and jokes and morality tales that she would often share with us. Uh, but yeah, this is a picture of her in during a visit to Chihuahua. But what we can do when we don't have a lot of information is figure out a lot of contextual clues, show this to a relative. My father would tell me, well, that was when I went to Chihuahua for the first time and I was eight years old. So that helps us situate it on a year and we can do a little bit of work in finding out the context of these pictures. Otherwise, uh, I really like the composition, but if I didn't have that other information from what my relatives can provide, I just know that it's my grandmother and it's somewhere and there's no other apparent sign otherwise, other than that there's a construction of a wall and some stairs. Okay, so now, we are at the point after having these best practices to really jump in to looking at what the library can offer. So we have three resources that can really help you with genealogy. The, uh, they're all accessible at madisonpubliclibrary.org slash genealogy along with other things. First is Ancestry Library that has all these things that are listed here and more. It's available remotely. So you with your library card through December, 2021 can log into it. If you have a card from a library that subscribes to it, such as Madison Public Library. And it's one of those things that we got through the pandemic. We've had access through this. Otherwise at the end of 2021, it's going to return to in library access only. And we'll be happy to welcome you to our library so you can explore that collection. We also have Heritage Quest, which you can get with any Madis any South Central Library system, they'll ask you for your library card whenever you click on one of these resources if you're not inside the library. So here we have the links to those databases and how you can access those, plus a couple other genealogy websites. And then one thing that I think stands out in the Ancestry Heritage that really helps us in the Heritage Quest is how to wrap our mind around uh, space and how we're looking at family history. So if we look at Wisconsin, we know that the library is situated in Dane County. We know that Crawford and Brown County are some regular sized uh, counties here in Wisconsin. But if we go back to when Wisconsin was a territory, we see that uh, if you're in Dane County and Madison is almost on this demarcation line, uh, we're actually in what was called Crawford and Brown County, and that's not even going back to what the original inhabitants of this area uh, called the uh, Dane County area, which is Dijop by the uh, Ho-Chunk peoples. But this shows you, I love this thing because when you're looking at ancestry and other databases, if you see uh, a, that someone lived in a given county, if you thought, well, my ancestor lived in Crawford County, that's going to be a different thing when they say Crawford County in the 1830s than it is in the 1840s, 1850s. So this is just really great to situate and know exactly what we're talking about. As you can see, counties get divided and subdivided until we get to the more familiar picture of the Wisconsin that we've known, the counties that we've known for the past hundred years or so. So that's always a good thing to compare and look at records and be more aware, not just of the dates and the biographies, but also of what the context is spatially of how these things occurred. We also have the Wisconsin Historical Society family history records, and these have uh, great access. They're on the open web. They're very Wisconsin specific, whereas Ancestry Library and Heritage Quest do cover, uh, have nationwide and also some international coverage. Uh, the one great thing about the Historical Society is that it's available on the open web and you can access it anywhere where you have internet access without having to have specific credentials. Okay, so how would you go about using these databases? I think one of the cautious words of caution with Ancestry is that Ancestry has about 2 billion people in its records. So putting in a name will very likely result in an overload and a cascade of records. So one of the ways that I've 
uh, found is uh, that's a good starting point is find a grave because uh, staying true to one of the best principles is starting with where your ancestor was last located and then working your way back. And uh, when you look at cemetery records and gravestones, it often has birth information. Uh, who they're buried next to can also be very important in contextual clues. It could be a husband, it could be a relative. Uh, sibling. So it's a great way of really starting from the graves and then working our way back. So one of the amusing stories my mother has told, and we're going to be looking at her grandmother, Esther, uh, we'll know her name, but we still have to go through a little bit of the history of her name. Uh, she was married three times in Madison, which must have been scandalous back in the early 20th century. Uh, so we know she was married to Mergen, which is the last name of my grandfather, but also to Stack and Presentine. Uh, because the anecdote goes, my other great-grandfather asked her, so what do I call her? Call you Mrs. Mergen, Mrs. Stack, Mrs. Presentine, sort of disapprovingly on the fact that this woman had decided to be her own person and wed three times. So, um, so if we start looking, if we go with uh, my grandfather's name, who I believe and we're pretty certain was her only child. Uh, if we go looking for Esther Mergen and find a grave, um, we don't find any results here that we know that she died in Madison. So we can quickly discount any of these as being a plausible record. Then we go to Esther Stack, which was one of the other names we had. And it looks like we are coming up with a bit of a conundrum because if we put Esther Stack, we are going to get a number of different results. And I think one of the things when you're doing research, uh, we have 54 matches. So what we want to do, and I'm doing this, walking you through this, is that you can put details that will help you narrow down into the form and get someone. And so this is one of the things we weren't able to find any matches under that name. Um, not surprisingly, I think that was her in-between husband. But if we look at Esther Presentine, Presentine, we can find a picture of her grave where it's located, a date of birth, a death date as recorded here, but also very interestingly here, we find the name of her spouse, Oscar Presentine at that time, name of the father, mother, death place, birthplace, cause of death. And this is, yeah, a really great resource that you can just look at and uh, find a lot of clues. So once you have these clues, you can feed this into Ancestry Library or another database. So from that, uh, record on find a grave, uh, found the birth date, the death date. And then here's one of the problems that we find. We have Jame Liveney. Uh, there is an S mid missing there most likely. And we have Angus, uh, likely it's Agnes. So we have to take those with a grain of salt. But once we have that information, we can go to Ancestry. So this is the Ancestry library that you can access right now with your library card remotely, but also within any of the Madison Public Library locations and other subscribing libraries. So if I have Esther Livney, and we know she was born in 1897 in Wisconsin. We start getting uh, Levine, Lindsay, Levine, Levine, uh, any number of different results. One of the great things about Ancestry is that it lets you uh, narrow down with what degree of match you can do that. So I'm getting a lot of Levines because those are close to the spelling and it allows me to look at more records. I was trying to see if I could find records that would be closer. So maybe I'll adjust the dial a little bit more to see if I can really find out that. And 
what happened? We've totally lost that. How can find a grave be wrong? Well, because it's done by humans, it's done as a labor of love, and there's also any number of places where that information could have been uh, misquoted or mishandled because this is, these are things that have been passed around and, and uh, have been handled by many people. So one of the great things that we can do here, maybe we know that that seemed to be a dead end, but we have the fact that we have some names, of course, doing a few corrections into James and Agnes. And you, voila, now we found a couple of good matches. So we know here, um, we know that she was married to a Mergen. Um, we know she had a mother named Agnes and a father named James. We know that's the name of my grandfather. So, and the other dates correspond. So um, of course I found this is something that my mother put together. So uh, I really appreciate the fact that that's there. I can validate her research because I have helped her with her and she's also a really good researcher. But we also find a couple of other things that lead us into more directions. So we have a social security application with uh, a variation on her married name of presenting one of her married names. We also see her filed under different names, Livsey, Livsey, Mergen. Here we have another person who's a different person, but it's still, it's looking for the names Esther, James, and Agnes. So those we want to discard because they don't have anything to do, but this has already given us a lot of information that we can then look into um, yeah, how things were recorded. One of the things that I really enjoy about Ancestry is that it gives you both the electronic format. So I can see here uh, the street where she lived. I can see everything rendered in terms of who lived with her and it checks out. Uh, there are stories about Aunt Maple and, and yeah, even uh, gives us an idea of where in the city they lived. And if you wanted to see what the page looks like, all the information is an electronic record, but a lot of the documents in Ancestry, you can see the original writing in the original paper. And yeah, it's really fascinating to look at documents that were written more than a hundred years ago. And I just have to wrap it up. I could spend all day talking about this, but let's keep going. So. The next thing we can do is look at the newspaper archive and other sources. So uh, we have a newspaper archive that has really good coverage of Wisconsin. We have newspapers.com that is very sparse from the 1970s up to neck now. But if you wanted to look at newspapers from the US, Canada, the UK, most of the English speaking world, you can find a lot of information there. And one of the things here with newspaper archive is that you're able to find things. So this was, these were all items that I found in newspaper archive. It shows when Mrs. Esther Mergen becomes the acting treasurer after the illness of a treasurer, it, of the uh, actual treasurer then. It then also shows how she prevails all the way up to Supreme Court after being accused of malfeasance that, that resulted in the city losing money and how she prevailed over that. It also has this very amusing colorful part of how she was granted a divorce. Uh, she had the grounds for cruel and inhuman treatment. She testified that her husband was very antisocial. He would come home and sleep most of the time in front of my friends. She charged that on occasion she would refuse to eat meals she had prepared for him. And I think this really puts into perspective how much we might think that we are oversharing on social media and how much that is uh, how even other more public forums, uh, this item was on the front of the Wisconsin State Journal. Um, how uh, we can find all this really great information in newspapers, all these anecdotes. And then here she is on her retirement uh, after serving many, many decades uh, for the city of Madison as assistant city treasurer. So here are a couple of other Wisconsin resources with primary sources. The Wisconsin Historical Society is a great point to continue your research. If you're looking at records at the university, there's uh, genealogy sources that the University of Wisconsin offers that might have different coverage than we have. And also the university archives for people who attended the university and also the Wisconsin Veterans Museum for those who served in the armed forces. 
And here's where I'm located and doing this presentation, the local materials area of our central library that has any number of books, pamphlets, city directories, government documents, pictures, newspaper indexes about Madison and Dane County. And we're always happy to see you here on the second floor of the library. Here are some links that when you get the presentation, you can click and these will, uh, I will populate it a little bit more on things that will directly take you to books in our collection that you can borrow. And if you have further questions, you can send it to the reference account and also visit madisonpubliclibrary.org genealogy to get you started. And thank you so much for this presentation and I'll take questions now. And great. I'll stop my share. Lots of great information there. Thanks so much. So um, there are a couple questions that came through on the Q&A. Um, one was, what do you do when you get stuck on a name because you run out of information or you can't tell which person with a similar name is your ancestor? I, I guess like the thing is to start to look at different sources um, and see to, um, okay, so we've considered the vital records. Maybe we can also see if there are baptism records or any other um, religious events that we might not um, those wouldn't be like in a civil records registry, but could be found on some genealogy databases. Um, we can see some newspapers. There might be some accounts, uh, depending on how much coverage there was of newspapers in a given area, but even there might be some small items in, uh, with initials. Like I was helping a person a few weeks ago as to locating an ancestor. And one of the things that I did is I went just to the initials of the person and we saw that there was uh, some less than flattering information that had resulted in a fine that's appearing court for poaching, but that had never come across because someone was always looking for the name. But I think it's just trying to dig back and see, are there any sources? And also, um, I think family relations are probably the most important things because if you can see an affiliation with someone, even though the names could be misspelled, um, there's less likelihood that someone would have the same set of names and the same last name. For one person, it's very likely. For two people, it might be, especially father and son. But for three people, sibling or mother, it becomes a little bit more as a distinguishing characteristic. Great. Thank you. Um, what do you recommend for families that are mostly from and have lived in another state, not Wisconsin? Well, I would go to newspapers.com, um, which is one of the databases we have. I would also say Ancestry has really tremendous coverage for anywhere in the United States. So both of those are really good sources. You can also see if the historical societies of that state or if those counties have any access. And I think we forget because everything is now available at the touch of a button, how much of genealogy work was done through correspondence, through people writing letters and sending it through snail mail across the United States and then filing a request getting some information back then filing a successive request over time right i think we're luckily we live in an era where we can ask, access things much more quickly but i think there's always a possibility of corresponding now you can do it over email or they might have forms there might be some charges for handling that information uh, to non-residents uh, that's something the madison library does but i think well that's also a thing to be cautious about is there might be a charge for duplication of documents Great. And I have to clarify the Madison Public Library gives everything freely to anyone in the seven county area within bounds. So we might print a few pages, send them if we're not going to print like 100 pages, but a few pages, we're happy to do that on a regular basis. Great. Wonderful. Um, a question about the personal archiving lab. Um, is there staff to help with that so that people can? There is. So what one of the things that's holding us up is that we had a bit of staffing and personal change at the library with the pandemic. So what we're doing right now is restructuring responsibilities and getting staff trained so that then staff can train people who come in. And then we will have some physical distancing requirements, but we will be able to teach two or three people at a time how to use both the flatbed scanner which helps you with photographs. But I think the more interesting thing is uh, photo slides because you can just take those tiny photo slides and then just put them in a format that you can really look at them. And then the audio and video cassette transcription uh, that's gonna be available too soon. So uh, that link is in the presentation. So look at that space for when it'll be, be available. I would think it would be within the next couple of months, hopefully sooner. Wonderful. Um, and then, 
is there somebody that can help um, correct errors when uh, which were made when entering data into Ancestry.com? Um, well, that is, I think, one of the problems is depends on where the error is. If it's in a record, there's not much we can do. If it's on someone's family tree that they already put in, it just becomes a, it might lead to a situation where the person might think they're absolutely right. So I think um, it would be difficult to correct that. And I think also it might generate some some conflict. I think people don't like to be challenged about things, even though they things might be demonstrably wrong. So um, I think for correcting the record, it's just one of those like, well, I know it's Livesey, even if it was spelled with an E, L-E-V, and that was in the census. So uh, that's already an error that's been around for almost 150 years that I can really do nothing about. But then the other ones that are more recent, I think it's just more approaching it with skepticism. And also, yeah, it's, I think, offering, I think the best solution in that case is offering a good case example of accurate research and presenting it and putting it out there if you feel comfortable by disclosing that information that you've researched. Great. I'm not seeing any other questions in the queue. I don't know if anybody else has any questions. I don't see anybody. So great. Um, I think that means, oh, uh, next question is about the September presentation. No, the September presentation is on cybersecurity for the person who just asked that question. Um, I don't know that I know the date, but all right, wonderful. Um, so I think that's it. Thanks, Martin. That was great. Very, very, um, very interesting. Lots of helpful resources. And we're always happy to help. Uh, we may not have the time to do all the research, but at least we'll help you navigate the interface, get you comfortable with using all our resources. Oh, uh, there's, I'm seeing a question. Is there a source to find obituaries? One of the things is that those are indexed in our catalog, at least the local ones, um, so that we can find. And also uh, that would be a, best, a great question for the reference desk. And we field those all the time. So we're always uh, glad to entertain those. Yeah, wonderful. Great. And, and then we did get a question about the presentation. Um, it will be made available. Yeah. Um, I want so to you'll have uh, all those. put in a few more uh, entry points for some of the print resources. So it's a little bit more complete, but it should be over to foundation then to share with uh, attendees uh, by the end of the day. Wonderful. Or I don't know when the foundation will share, but I will certainly have it in. I know there has to be some other processing and stuff. Great. All right, wonderful. Well, um, thank you much everybody for attending. Um, as we mentioned, next um, next presentation, next uh, educational series will be on September 40, um, and the uh, materials will be made available to you so you can uh, research. And of course, the live the folks at the library are always available to help as well. Oh, um, I, I see one family has family going back to Scotland and Wales in the 15th century and family search. You may take some of that with a grain of salt, but I think best is to try to confirm and find the records originally for those. Um, I know that my grandmother did that. Uh, she went to Isle of Skye and visited Castle Dunvegan to look at the MacLeod book and saw that a lot of the information checked out. So great. But I, I'd say uh, trust, but verify. <laughs> Yep. Wonderful. All right. Wonderful. Well, thanks everybody. And uh, the materials will be made available. Some, it looks like by noon tomorrow. So, all right. Thanks for coming. And thank you, Martin. That was great. Thank you, Laura. Thanks yep. to the foundation and Jenny and everyone. Everyone. Yes, absolutely. Wonderful.